Hi, I'm Ken Johnson. I'm a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, and today we're going to talk about creating terrarium ornaments. Terrarium ornaments are a great way to add some living decor to your home. They're also easy to make and a great way to include some kids in a craft project. To make a terrarium ornament, there's a few basic supplies you're going to need. Obviously, you'll need some sort of ornament. You can use plastic ornaments like this that can be snapped together, kind of like a clamshell. They also make ornaments that are specifically made for creating terrariums, and you can see they have these large holes in them. They come in plastic as well as glass, and there are also some of these terrarium ornaments that can be hooked together to create a chain. Next, you'll need to decide what type of plants you want to use. Some popular plants for creating terrarium ornaments include succulents like sedums or hens and chicks. Air plants are also quite popular, and you can also use something like moss. The types of plants you choose are going to play a role in what type of growing media you'll use when creating your terrarium ornament. If you're using succulents or some other sort of rooted plant, you want to use potting mix, and getting some activated charcoal may also be a good idea. If you're using air plants, you can use sand or small gravel to place your plants in, and if you're using moss, you can use soil or whatever that moss was growing on. You may also want to look for some decor to include in your terrarium ornament, such as rocks or sticks or bark. You can also use any kind of knickknacks laying around the house or look at for these in a craft store. You'll also want to get some string that you can use to hang your ornament with. And depending on the type of ornament you use, you may need to get some tape. A mister and tweezers can also be used, but they are not necessary to put together a terrarium ornament. The first terrarium we'll make, we're going to be using moss. You can find moss outdoors in shady areas of your landscape, or if you don't have any moss in your yard or you don't have a yard, it can also be purchased. If there are stores in your area that sell terrarium supplies, they may have moss, or there are also several companies online that will sell it. If you have a plastic clamshell-like ornament like this that's going to snap together, um, this is probably the best choice because moss is going to thrive in moist environments. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to put a scoop of this activated charcoal in the bottom of that ornament and this is just going to kind of help collect some of that excess moisture that may be in the soil. Next I'm going to take some of this moss that I found in my backyard. I'm going to put this into my ornament and kind of gently pack that down in there like this. Next I can add any sort of trinkets or decor that I want. So I've, I've gone and collected some rocks in my backyard. So I will just stick these in there. And I also decided I'm going to use this little kind of evergreen Christmas tree uh, type ornament here. I'll stick that down in my moss. So then when I'm happy with that, I'll go ahead and put this ornament back together. And if you're using an ornament like this that's going to snap together, you want to try to put these little eye eyelets on either side of the ornament. That's going to hold best. And you can see uh, on this ornament, this side right here is on the top. So this is the side I'm going to want to tape in order to really hold this ornament together well so it doesn't fall apart when I go and hang it. So I'm just going to put a little tape on either side of this hook. So once I've got my tape on there, our ornament is ready to hang. Next we'll make a succulent terrarium ornament. So succulents can be found in many different nurseries and garden centers as well as a variety of places online. Since succulents like drier conditions, an ornament that's got an open front like this is probably going to be the best option. So again, just like our moss, I'm going to put some of this activated charcoal down at the bottom. And again, this is going to um, kind of hold on to some of that excess moisture that may be in there so our growing media doesn't get too wet. Next, I'm going to put in that growing media. And in this case, I've got some potting mix um, that's kind of specifically made for cactus or other succulents, and this has got a little more sand in it. It's a little bit looser, so it's not going to retain quite as much water. And fortunately, succulents are fairly shallow rooted, so we don't have to worry about having a tremendous amount of potting mix in here. Now, it's also going to be important to make sure you don't get too much so that it doesn't start spilling out of the opening here. Once we have our mix in there, we can start adding our decor, and you want to start working from the back to the front. So I'm going to put some rocks in here again that I found uh, in my yard. And if you have fat fingers like I do, this is where the tweezers may come in handy. So I've got some rocks 
in there. I'm going to take some of my succulents here. I'm just going to make a little indentation there, stick my plants in there, and then kind of firm up that soil around those. And as those roots start growing, we'll kind of anchor themselves uh, much better into this mix. And these are kind of on the small end. Um, you can use much larger succulents in there. And I'm going to put one of my little snowmen in here. I should have put this in earlier, but better late than never. And since I'm going to go with a little bit of a, a winter theme here, I'm going to take some of this sand that I have, and I'm going to sprinkle that over our potting mix to kind of make it look like it has snowed. So I'll do another scoop in here. And then when you're happy with the way that looks, you can go ahead and put your string on your ornament. And then it will be ready to hang. The last terrarium ornament we'll put together, we're going to use air plants. Air plants like these other plants we've used can be found in many different nurseries and garden centers, often lumped in with the cacti, as well as a variety of different places online. Air plants grow as epiphytes, so they don't need any soil to grow in. Instead of using their roots to take up nutrients, they use their roots to attach to plants and other rocky substrates. So for this ornament, I am going to use some sand as our kind of our growing media. This is basically just going to hold the, these air plants in place. And then when we're happy with the amount we have in there, again, we can add in any decor we may want, again, working from the back to the front. So here I've got my air plant. I'm going to stick that in there. And the end, I'm going to kind of twist that down into the sand so it's anchored in there fairly well. And then we'll add this little bird in there as some additional decor. And there we have our air plant terrarium ornament. So here we have the three ornaments we've made. We'll go through real quickly how to care for these. First for our moss ornament. Again, moss likes moist conditions. That's why we use this ornament that seals up. So hopefully we won't need to add any additional water to that. Moss thrives in kind of shady conditions, so indirect light is going to be best for these types of ornaments. For our succulents, succulents are going to like bright sunny conditions. So if you don't have those types of conditions in your house, you may need to use some supplemental or artificial lighting for these plants. Again, they also like dry conditions. That's why we use this ornament with the open front. So make sure that growing media dries out in between waterings. For our air plants, these are going to do best with bright indirect light preferably with an east or west facing window. There's a couple of different ways we can water these. First, we can mist these probably every other day, especially if you have a house with low humidity. You can also take these plants out of their ornaments, put them under running water a couple times a week, and dry those off and put them back into your ornament. Or you can take them out once a week, submerge them in water for about 20 minutes to an hour, again, letting them dry off before you put them back into your ornament. So once you're done with your ornaments, you can hang them from your tree, but this isn't the only way you can use them. You can give them as gifts. You can use them as a centerpiece, put them on the mantle, especially if you have one of these flat bottom ornaments. You can also hang them from a hook in the ceiling and enjoy them throughout the year. Thanks for watching and keep on growing. Hello everyone and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening questions. So start thinking of those questions now. My name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist here for U of I Extension and I'm based here in the Bloomington area. You are here for our spooky Halloween show. I think this is our this is our third year, I think, third or fourth year doing this fun show. We always have a lot of fun with this one, so thank you for joining us. Um, I have a couple of other great horticulturists on with me today who love to talk about different topics. I myself love to talk about any flower topic, hence the flower crown, which I'll show you tonight. Um, so cut flowers, annuals, perennials, those are my favorite topics to chat about. But Kelly, you want to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm a horticulture educator based out of Bloomington and I am a, love talking about insects, um, particularly killing them. I, that's my specialty. <laughs> However, like I say, 
Uh, I spend more time talking about uh, conserving them with pollinators and butterflies and beneficial insects. And I suffer from arachnophilia, which means I love spiders. Not phobia, philia, huh? Yeah, not phobia, philia. Love Do it. Do you suffer from arachnophilia, Candace? No. I would no. probably, no. I'm somewhere in the middle. I wouldn't say phobia or philia. I'm, I'm neutral. Neutral is good. Neutral. I'm neutral with spiders. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a spider fan, but um, I'm also Ryan Pancaw, a horticulture educator out of Champaign. Um, and my specialty is trees and shrubs. That's really like what a lot of my training and experience is in, but I also like vegetable gardening. I also like native plants. And that's why I came tonight as a prickly pear cactus. And to be even more spooky than the spines and prickliness that I have on me, I'm flowering right now. And I should have done this in June. <laughs> you know, so I'm even more scary because I'm, I'm flowering at a weird time. So you're out of season. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, we are also in the evening, which we have never done before. So we're we're excited to kind of try this out and see how everybody um, likes to show in the evening. If you have gardening questions, whether it's about spooky or wicked plants or anything gardening related, feel free to start adding those in the comment box and we'll be happy to answer those um, today as we go through. Um, to kick us off, I think we're just going to start talking about some wicked, spooky uh, plants. We have a couple books that we're going to show you and a couple other things. So, um, Kelly, you want to kick us off and maybe start showing some of the cool plants that you have yeah. with you tonight? I mean, you can't think spooky plants and not think coniferous plants. <laughs> they, totally. they are super fun because they eat bugs. Um, so plants, you know, they need some nutrients from the soil. It helps them um, build you know, proteins, and it helps them feed themselves. And so when they live in a bog, which is a place where there's lots of water, they're unable to like even derive these nutrients from the soil. So where do they get those? Where do they, they get them from insects? And it's fascinating what they do. So the first one is, and you know, there's many spooky stories about Venus flytrap it's this really cool um, open facing kind of trap. It has hairs on the inside. And when those hairs are triggered, it snaps shut. Well, it also lures the insects by having this sweet tasting dew on the, uh, the trap. And then once those hairs are triggered, it traps the, the, the insect can't really get away. Now, I can go through and I can actually touch those hairs and uh, I can get it to close. And now it's not going to stay closed for the 10 days that it would have stayed closed if it had been an insect because it requires you to actually move those hairs again for it to release its digestive enzymes. Because so I'm not torturing the plant <laughs> when I sit here and I rub those hairs and it snaps shut. Oh. <laughs> cool. So really cool. It gets its nutrients from insects. Now this uh, pitcher plant, um, when um, Candace and I went to college together, um, we worked in a greenhouse and there was all, uh, always a diverse collection of uh, these carnivorous plants. We there would be sundews and crazy pitcher plants with huge pitchers. Uh -huh. And what happens is these also lure insects in with the, thinking that they're, they're going to find food, and they'll slip down and they'll get trapped in the water. And digestive enzymes are released. And then there's even like small hairs at the bottom that prevent the insect from climbing out. And uh, the ones in the green, some of the ones in the greenhouse, remember Candace, weren't they like 16 uh, yeah. inches long? Huge. They were so amazing, so beautiful. And uh, it was just a really cool experience to deal with plants and how they make such amazing adaptions. 
you know, if we just had our own greenhouses where we could replicate that. Because I think we both said as we were shopping for these plants, how many of these we've actually killed in our in our time as as horticulturists. Because like you said, they're bog plants. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of people bring them home and assume that you want to treat them like any other house plant, but really you have to recreate kind of that boggy environment with like a terrarium or something like that, right? And I have been more successful than sundews, than Venus flytrap or pitcher plant. But um, um, yeah, it was they were really easy to grow at the greenhouse because we had a special kind of water that that didn't have all those normal nutrients like mm-hmm. fluoride that are in the water, you know. And um, that kind of thing is not good for these types of plants. So I'm actually um, having my colleagues save some rainwater. Oh, nice. Even though I've killed them several times, <laughs> I'd like to try to keep it alive again. But I know I it trying. has to have special water or it's not going to um, survive. And uh, I am going to try to create that small micro uh, climate. I think I'm going to put it back in the tubes that it came in. And, you know, um, sometimes plants, these kind of cool niche plants are uh, what we call a flower arrangements with roots. <laughs> Me, yeah. They'll last a couple months and then maybe you don't have the right environments and you just throw it away. And, you know, this was super affordable plant and I've had so much fun with it ever since I got it. Um, just Worth yeah. the money for me. Worth it, yeah. Love that. So, so it probably needs a little higher, like, relative humidity than our mm-hmm. house would support, mm-hmm. you know? that's Gosh, that's just the biggest challenge with some of those sensitive house plants, like how you like get... Like orchids and, yeah, mm-hmm. tropical. Mm-hmm. Nice. Well, if any of you out there watching have had good luck with these or you've tried them in the past, uh, let us know in the comments. Good. We always like to hear how, how you guys have experienced them, too. Very cool. So coniferous plants, love that. Those mm-hmm. are definitely spooky, cool plants to talk about. <laughs> what else do you have, Kelly? While um, we're waiting for I, questions, still. I do have the, you know, I, I know I'm an insect girl, but um, Candace and I met at the greenhouses at the University of Illinois. So we we uh, we learned how to grow a diversity of plants. So we're, we're like really into tropicals and these kind of niche plants. So I feel like I'm like a trendsetter saying, look, black ZZ plant, look at my black ZZ plant, isn't it awesome? You know, I walk around with this plant sometimes in my office and I show people. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's like, it, it's super cute. It's perfect decoration for the season. And, uh, oh yeah, uh-huh. And we're twins too. We're twins. In the same plant. Yeah. In the white, same white pot. Man, that was yeah. great marketing. Talk about black. <laughs> if you're gonna have a black pant pot, put it in a white, a black plant, put it in a white pot. Yeah. Then uh, well, I, I think I have a similar a triplet to that. When, <laughs> when you found those, I wouldn't found uh, oh nice. <laughs> nice. Can't beat it. Well, I think what's so cool about this is that it's different than the typical ZZ plant. I mean, most of us are so used to that dark green foliage of ZZ, which is awesome. ZZ is a killer houseplant. But when you can get something different, that's we're always into that. Yeah. ZZ is a great houseplant to have an easy houseplant. So this is not one of those niche plants that you're going to be throwing in the trash can. These are mm-hmm. one of this plant's going to stick with you for a while. Yeah. And Cynthia, I see your question. She asked, what's the name of that pretty black plant? It is a ZZ plant. So just the letter Z, Z, and then plant. And you'll be able to find this one in particular is Raven is usually the, the name for this dark, um, dark black one, but it's pretty cool. Loving this plant. Love it. Yes. And also, it tolerates low light, too, which is great. This one's mm-hmm. sitting in the middle of my kitchen island, so it's away from windows on all sides, but it does, does great still. Yeah, it's a great office plant, too. Um, that's what we have in the, this office here, the extension office. If I want my colleagues to grow plants in their office, I just give them ZZ plants and doesn't matter the light, doesn't matter how good at watering they are. 
if they water, <laughs> they will be successful. Yeah. Or don't overwater also. <laughs> well, yeah, don't overwater. That's usually not the case. But <laughs> yes. Like I'm 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 more likely to overwater than them. Mm -hmm. Very cool. What else do you have, Kelly? Um, I have a grape jelly dikea. And if you see the colors, it's this really kind of brilliant, dark purplish black. Um, when we saw this plant, it just really stood out for that color and so shiny and gorgeous. And this is, um, we found out was like, um, Candace and I had never seen this plant before. Yeah. And so we found out that it was related to bromeliads. So if I did have it, which I think I'm gonna have no problem taking care of this plant. Now I may not have it in the best humidity because it is a tropical and it probably does require a little bit more humidity. Um, and that may prevent it from flowering. But, you know, um, I'm okay because the, the foliage is super gorgeous and I, I'm, I'm okay if it doesn't flower. <clears throat> um, so then I don't have to feel so guilty not providing the perfect conditions. Then we found this really cool spiky um, uh, succulent plant and, and, and we had grown this in the greenhouse before and this one's called Stapelia and what it does is it, it, it flowers at the base and it's a very large flower and it's kind of soft like, like material and it stinks a little bit and so can you imagine what is probably trying to pollinate that? Flies um, mm -hmm. or beetles or something like that and so uh just loved the architecture of the plant, just how cool it was and how it branched off. We loved the the way it um, the way it branched. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I could, you see the little tiny branch off the side. It just was a really cool plant. Yeah, so, very cool. One more string of needles, Ryan. <laughs> string of needles. String of needles, and then I'll dash them into the string of hearts, right? And Candace and I were talking about this. It's a cool plant. One of the things that I, I, I know I'm going to be fine with light because I have a really good south facing window. I just need to make sure I don't overwater it because mm -hmm. I am a little worried because think about it, it doesn't have a lot of foliage. Yeah. So it's not going to dry out really fast. So I need to be very careful not to water this before it needs it. So I'm going to really let it dry down and then I'm going to water it thoroughly and let it keep drying down between waterings. And I'm going to do the same with this string of hearts. You know, not a lot of foliage. That's the one thing I'm worried about is the overwatering, but such a cool little plant. Very cool. Yeah, we were we were talking about how like all of these string of whatever plants are seem to be kind of trendy right now with your string of pearls and string of bananas and dolphins and all these different things that people visualize the leaves looking like. It was pretty funny. And you said string of turtles. Yeah, I saw string of turtles the other day too. So I was like, what else? What else is there? <laughs> Uh, Deb asked, what was the name of the grape jelly one again, Kelly? Dykia, D-Y-K-I-A. D-Y-K-I-A. It oh, was, um, yeah, just when we found that one, we were like, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. Like, yes, this is my plant. Yeah, we're always, like I said, always on the look for something that, well, that we don't have already. And it's, right. it's kind of a... Unique. So some of these you might, you guys might have trouble finding. So you, you may have to kind of shop around or maybe even go online for some of these too, because they're obviously not your everyday house plant. You may have to do a little bit of, of hunting at more specialty uh, garden centers. Yeah, I'm, I'm a higher end garden center that has, you know, some tropicals around would probably have some, some of it. It's, it's interesting to me. There's like... Um, some smaller shops popping up that are just houseplants, 
you know, yeah. it's, not, it's not a whole garden center. It's just specialty kind of house plants. Mm-hmm. I think it just goes along with like the the trend of house plants being really popular right now. But good for all of us plant geeks that you know want some of those. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, so check out your local local sh- scene. You might have a shop that specializes in that. So. Yeah. And I think it's really fun to collect house plants and like you know it's fun to de- you know you, Candace, what's your number one go to in decoration? I mean plants, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you just yeah. can't can't beat plants sitting around you. Um, mm-hmm. I have plants around me, and I'll look at them all the time and admire them. And I know I'm not unique, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I get I am unique. <laughs> we are probably a little bit unique. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, mm-hmm. for me, empty empty corner, great spot for a plant. <laughs> empty spot on the buffet, good spot for a plant. Although right now I'm I'm in the switch over to Christmas mode, mm. so I'm I'm having to kind of move the the house plants around to make room for the the Christmas decor to come out. But that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but yeah, I love that too, Ryan. I love seeing all these new new plant shops popping up. It's awesome. Cool. Okay. Well, if you guys have any questions, whether it's about these plants or any other gardening topic we are happy to answer for you especially kind of going in the fall if there's um, tasks you're kind of thinking about for the garden this time of year we're happy to to help you out but while we keep waiting for um questions you want to kind of take a look at some flower crowns that sound sound good i can't wait i'm gonna be a fairy i'm gonna be a fairy and yeah, if you need a, it's going to be a print a, a princess. <laughs> if you need a very simple Halloween costume, or honestly, it doesn't have to be Halloween. I wear flower crowns all all the time. Um, <laughs> I'm going to show you a pretty. There's lots of ways to make flower crowns. They're fairly simple. Don't take a lot of um, items, which is which is awesome. So basically, what you need is some type of structure to attach your flowers to. So this could be a piece of um, wire, it could be a pipe cleaner, it could be just kind of whatever you might have at home that has some structure to it and some bend to it. So this in particular is um, like a bark covered wire you can get from the craft store. But like I said, it could just be a plain old piece of wire and you're going to cut that so that you can kind of get the size of crown that you need for who you're making that for. So I went ahead and cut that. Um, to a length. And then you just need whatever kind of garden material you have handy. So I took a little walk around my flower garden and and harvested a couple of things. So my uh, marigolds are still um, looking great. I had some um, little celosia um, heads that I cut, some um, amaranthus there, nice burgundy color, and some um, ageratum, nice blue. So just take a walk around your perennial garden, whatever you have uh, handy to. You don't need a lot of material, which is great. And then also some some leaves too. So I cut some smoke bush uh, leaves. These could just be whatever's fallen to the, to the ground. So you need your kind of piece. And then you need something that you're going to wrap around to attach those flowers. So this it could be the same kind of similar wire. Um, I, again, um, have just kind of a paper covered wire this time. So it's a little thinner than this one. But again, it could be pieces of pipe cleaner. It could be pieces of string. You can kind of get creative with what you might have already. But basically, it's a lot like making a wreath. If you've ever made a wreath, and we'll demo that probably on our December um, show again. Uh, But basically, what you're doing is making little bundles that you're attaching to a frame. So I might start with a little piece of, uh, a couple pieces of smoke bush, maybe a piece of ageratum, and then a, a marigold. So think of it as like a little mini boutonniere, uh, basically. So you you make that little bundle. You're going to lay it on your piece of wire here at one end. And then you're just going to wrap around with that other piece of wire to attach that little bundle on okay and i like to keep i didn't i missed the smoke bush bad demo 
<laughs> if it has short stems. There we go. Let's try it again. Oh, but yeah, can, that's a good demo. Oh, you can <laughs> always start over if you don't secure it right the first if time. If it falls off, just put it back on. That's easy peasy. <laughs> and I like to start with my piece a little bit longer so you can kind of just keep going down the line. So you've got that first little bundle and then all you do is just keep doing that. So the next time I might do like a piece of amaranthus and maybe some solution, just another little short grouping. And this time I'm going to lay it right on top of the other stem. So it doesn't go like directly on top of it. You're going to kind of put it back a little bit farther, hold it down. And then again, take that other wire and just wrap it around until you've got it attached. And then all you do is you you repeat, make a little bundle, lay it down. So, do, do, so I've noticed, if, is it me or do marigolds get brighter when the temperature is cool? I tell you, man, they really shine when the days get shorter and the temperatures get cooler. I was just listening to a podcast about this actually from another flower farmer and he was talking about how like how many marigolds they grow for like Dia de los Muertes um, and Halloween and how really they just kind of grow foliage all summer long. They don't really flower a ton until the days start to get shorter. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I guess I've never really thought about that or noticed it really. I, I always think of marigolds just as a summer in the fall flower, I guess. But once he had talked about that, I was like, yeah, you're right. They really do start to pump out the flowers and when it comes to um, fall, which is pretty cool. Yeah, they're, they are definitely the best looking thing in my vegetable garden. We did those on like the yeah. Yeah, those. And, yeah uh, it's amazing. The only thing looking good. Right now. <laughs> and right? I love that you flower growers are starting to grow marigolds yeah. more. like I'm seeing it at the farmers markets I'm seeing it in professional flower arrangements and on online and stuff uh -huh. so just yeah, really I'm, cool color yeah I'm definitely growing more next year and the key is if you if you do want to grow them at for cut flowers is to be a little bit selective on your varieties you're not necessarily going to go to the garden center and purchase the typical kind of bedding uh, marigold that you, that you find a lot of times because your stem length will be pretty um, short. So I grow specifically ones that are bred to be at least like 18, 24 inches in, mm -hmm. in height so that you have, obviously for a flower crown, it doesn't matter. But if you're making bouquets or a vase arrangement, you want kind of some bigger, bigger um, stem length. Okay, so here's how it's um, here's how it's shaping up. I've just kept kept making bundles and working the way down the line, and you can go all the way to the end. You just want to leave enough that you can kind of tie it uh, in the back so that it fits whoever you're going to be wearing that flower crown. And then I'll show you the back. That's on the back. Obviously, you're not going to see that, but you can see all that wire that's been wrapping around to hold it in a place. And then, of course, you've got the pretty side then that will sit on your on your head. So if you need an addition to your Halloween costume uh, <laughs> this weekend, whip yourself up a quick little flower crown and just have fun with it. It doesn't, especially if you're just wearing it for a Halloween costume, if it falls apart, it falls apart. It doesn't have to last long. Um, you're, it's just kind of just have fun with it and get creative. Well, that would have been way easier than my cactus hat. <laughs> spine on. Hence why I went with that, Orion. <laughs> That's why it's my costume. <laughs> it's a really cool addition. Hey, uh, what, a, what a great, easy, last-minute outfit. There you go. You're a, yeah. a, 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 plant, a flower. Wicked plants t-shirt and a flower yeah. crown. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Okay, let me see if we've had any questions. I think I've seen a couple come through here. Um, okay, Cynthia asks, what's the best kind of artificial lighting to overwinter a majesty palm indoors? So yeah, we're kind of at that period of time where people are bringing mm -hmm. in those tropical plants from outside to, 
to inside. So any tips on artificial lighting indoors, what do you think? I'd say the best tip is go with LEDs. Mm -hmm. uh, they seem to be, well, from a, an energy standpoint, are going to be the lowest energy consumption for the light. And they just, they keep coming out with just new and better versions of all that LED lighting. So that's usually where I start looking. Mm -hmm. And it's more affordable. It gets more and more affordable. Like I remember when LED was new and the thing, and it was, you know, kind mm -hmm. of out of our price range. And now every time I turn around, there's LED lights that are really affordable and easy to use. And yeah, they just come in a huge variety from, you know, just your a bulb that you would screw into any fixture to um, string lights, mm -hmm. um, different, you know, someone here in our office, uh, she doesn't have very good light at her desk, but wanted a plant, has one of those bendable ones that's kind of like a desk lamp that just sits mm -hmm. over it. Mm -hmm. uh, probably not great for a large house plant, but they just, there's a ton of different um, configurations that come in these days. And, and yeah, like Kelly said, very affordable. Yeah. And you can put them on a timer so that, because typically with indoor lights, you want them on probably like 14, 16 or so hours and then kind of off for, for eight or so. So they're not on 24, um, seven, which is usually pretty good. Yeah. And timers, I mean, there's a ton of different types you can use from just the old mechanical ones that kind of turn and click on and off to like, I have some that are on um, Wi-Fi little outlets that I can mm -hmm. turn on and off for my phone, you know? Yeah, me too. Um, and, you know, can program them to turn on and off at different times. So that's that's what I use for all my like vegetable growing lights now. They're on those Wi-Fi timers and you can program the, you know, hours of light they get through that too. Mm -hmm. so. Awesome. Pretty interesting. Okay, well, hopefully that helps, Cynthia. Uh, let's see. Michelle asks, is it okay to water houseplants and succulents with ice cubes? I've heard that it may not be good, but I've always used them for my smaller plants. I think we've talked about this before. What do you guys think about ice cubes for houseplant watering? Um, I don't know if I've ever been asked that question before in my oh, life. Yeah. Maybe we have it. Maybe we were just talking about orchids specifically. I don't remember. Um, I, I I would never <laughs> <laughs> water my uh, plants with ice cubes because I'm very particular about my watering. <laughs> um, yeah. I want to, I, it, I'm one of those, I let things dry down between watering. I do not put my finger in the top. I'll put my finger in the bottom. I want my root ball completely dry before I water it. Um, but and so then I want when I'm watering it, I want to it to water and I want it to come out the bottom. And then I do not want my roots sitting in water. So I don't want I'm gonna dump the the uh, um, container underneath it out, and I'm never gonna like for instance these ZZ plants. These little white pots, they don't have holes at the bottom, but they have a plastic pot in here. So all of us, we love the white pot. So, but we, when we water this, we take it out and put it in the sink to water it and allow it to drain through. So, um, you know, I want to make sure that it is completely saturated. And then I want to make sure that I'm not having it sit in water. And I'm not sure I love the idea of, it, I, I know ice cubes, I know why they do it because it, um, for orchids, you know, it's like spritzing the, the velum in on the roots, but what do you think, Candace? I, I, I'm curious to hear what you say. I'm like you. I think you'd have a much better watering practice if you did, like you said, and really water the full root system. Because I think what would happen, and she mentioned she does it on smaller plants, so it's it's probably okay. But I, I think what would happen over time is you would only be wetting the very kind of top portion of the, the root system and not the bottom. And you'd end up with a pretty poor root system. So I get why it's popular because I mean, it's sure it sounds very easy to just toss a couple of ice cubes on there, walk away and just let them, let them go. But yeah, I think it'd be a better practice to water like normal. I'd rather you put them in a kitchen sink, pull out the sprayer and start going to town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if it's working for you, 
That's <laughs> yeah, that's great. But I would just kind of keep an eye on it, check your check out how your root system's doing and yeah, see how it's going. Good question. Okay, let's see. Deb had a question. Can I overwinter Amanda v Villa uh, plant indoors? What kind of light will it need? <laughs> Um, you know what? This is funny because I have a mandevilla right on the other side of that door. Oh, do you really? <laughs> I could not throw away. It was so cute. So you're going to keep it indoors then, huh? I am. I'm going to keep it indoors. Um, I, uh, I think I'm going to, um, I think I'm not sure what to do. Um, I think it's going to need bright sun if I want mm -hmm. it to keep flowering. And I'm not even going to think I'm going to keep it flowering. Because, yeah. um, I'm not sure if I want to get light specifically for my overwintering mandevilla. But, <laughs> you um, just want to keep it living through the winter, basically. Yeah, that's what I think I'm going to do. I'm going to keep it living in the winter. And so uh, I'm not even going to worry about um, too much sun, uh, but I'm going to give it a little bit. It's probably going to drop some leaves. I'm probably going to water it. Not a lot. Um, people, we do slow down our watering in the winter, but one thing we need to remember is that we turn our heater vents on and then that sucks all the air out. And sometimes I'm watering more in the winter than I am in the summer because of the heating vents. So, uh, yeah, and that's because that extra heat kind of evaporates water. Your home gets drier in winter, just in general, um, so as your heat comes on. So. Yeah, I'm just going to let it creep along. And then in the spring, after it gets probably, Mandeville is a, a tropical, so I wouldn't pull it out till around the middle of May. Then I would cut it all the way back pretty much, and I would fertilize it and let it go to town. Easy. Yeah. There you go. So you're probably going to put it in your southern facing window there in your office. Are you going to give it any supplemental light? You think you're just going to go with the window? No, no, supplement. no, no, no. no. South no. facing window. And then I have overwintered other annual pots. I mean, I in a garage, and even allowed them to dry down really good and what and you know maybe even water them one or two times, and. Um, the garage can get, you know, pretty low where I can like put some like pots of ageratum or um, pots of annuals that I've grown over the summer. I will put in a uh, garage and I'll almost forget them. And then I'll pull them out in the spring. I'll cut them back and re-fertilize them and they will just come back with a vengeance because they already have such this established root system. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but that's, you can't do that too much. Yeah, that's essentially what I do with all of my succulent pots too. I bring them inside, put them in either the garage or some other kind of coolish area. And I basically just kind of let them go dormant for mm -hmm. the winter. They get a little bit of light, but I hardly water them. And just kind of let them chill out. And then obviously in the spring, by the time the spring comes, they're not looking primo. So you kind of clean them up, bring them back out. Like you said, fertilizer, bring them sun and... Bam, by midsummer, they're full and growing like uh, crazy again. I think last fall I wrote a blog or, yeah, I think it was last fall or the fall before I wrote a blog about how I was sad and how I was like sitting here going, trying to decide which plant was going to live and which plant was <laughs> not going to live. <laughs> right. I mean, horticulturists, we always have that at the end of the season. We do. Because we We're can't like, stop growing. I mean, do we, we don't just like, at May, we don't just like stop. We grow in June, July, we start new in August. Yeah. Then, They're like, do we have the space to bring it in? Do we have the energy to bring it in? Do we want to bring it in? <laughs> and then Frost, you're like, oh my gosh, I have a hundred books. <laughs> <laughs> that well, night like Maybe you both experienced this where like the um, design of the rooms and furniture and things centers around how to keep that south facing window yes. totally open oh, yeah. for plants. Oh, or, yeah. I mean, I've, I've looked at different houses and things with the idea of, oh, there's no south windows here. I can't live in this. <laughs> this is not but, acceptable. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I, I just don't understand why anyone would ever build a house and not put in south facing windows, you know, and there's so many yeah. of them out there that, you know, could have had just awesome, windows across the whole south side, but um, instead they put them on the north. 
Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy people. <laughs> okay, I think we've got, let's see, one over here on YouTube also. Uh, t- Tim commented first, he said the big thorny honey locust is the spookiest plant. That is for sure. If you ever come across the honey locust with thorns on it, they are crazy. Oh, um, can I say something? I've yeah, go for it. Seen a honey locust with a rabbit impaled on it. Oh, geez. Whoa. <laughs> like the <laughs> rabbit had jumped over the <laughs> and then failed itself. Nature. It was not funny. I was freaked out at the time. Nature is I know cruel. crazy. Yeah. Um, let's see. Tim also had a question. He said, I have some potted strawberries, viburnum, and other perennials I've rooted from cuttings. Would they be better off in the ground and mulched or kept somewhere else sheltered in their pots until spring? What do we think? Hmm. Yeah, I meant, and a lot of people do that. Um, usually, you know, um, you know, Candace and I, I, I keep saying this, we went to college together. Can you guys tell? <laughs> <laughs> um, we learned that you can plant a perennial Anytime the ground is diggable. So, mm-hmm. you know, even though we're getting close to frost, I mean, some of those perennials are really good at establishing roots really quick. But this late, you're risking it a little mm-hmm. bit. And then, but but lots of people, I mean, lots of gardeners do this. Well, they'll buy a plant and they'll forget to plant it. And then it'll sit in there. Um, garage all all winter, just like dormant, going dormant, like what Candace and uh-huh. I do with some of our annual pots. Uh-huh. So m- my thing would be to either treat them as house plants and keep them growing, or let them go a little bit dormant in the cooler temperatures of your garage and just water them every now and then. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, what would you say? You're the perennial person. Look at me answering your question. No, I would say the same thing. I mean, I am uh, taking a risk myself. In the last two weeks, I've planted probably about 500 perennial plugs in my landscaping. So just very small um, plugs, which was a little bit later than ideally I wanted, but that's when they came. So that's when I planted them. And I'll mulch them, and and, and I, I think they're going to be just fine. They've got plenty of rain. There's time to get some roots established, and I think they're going to do just fine. But you're right. I think it'd probably be safer to bring them in, kind of let them basically go dormant and um, wait till the spring. One thing you got going for you is it's near your house, and that kind of yeah. creates that microclimate that where yeah. the ground up there is not going to freeze whenever it's yeah. starting to freeze. Yeah, location definitely makes a difference, yeah. Cool, awesome question, very good. Okay, let me see, I think we've caught all of those and caught up. So if you have questions, keep them coming, add them to the comment box. We're happy to help with any gardening uh, queries you might have. Um, Kelly, did you have any other, did we cover all your uh, plants? Well, yeah, I actually (laughs) wanted to ask about that cool t-shirt. Yeah, let's let's talk about the prickly pear cactus. What's going on over there? <laughs> oh, oh me. Yeah. Um, well, so I did uh, this. This uh, costume was inspired by a, a horticulture project at my house. So um, I was lucky enough to have a family member that had a giant raging p- prickly pear cactus. And if you all aren't familiar with this native cactus, you know, it's one of few that are native to Illinois. There's mm-hmm. there's three different types of prickly pear cactus where Eastern prickly pear is kind of the most common. And there's a couple others that are just pretty rare and in their distribution, but I have a little quick um, slideshow. I'll go here and go ahead and share my screen. Um, let's see. Um, so here's kind of just a, nice. a slide. I, um, Oh, need to swap. Here's a slide of just the prickly pear cactus. So you can see how my little um, tuft on the top of my <laughs> hat kind of represents the flower, but uh, just a really neat, unique, you know, kind of different um, native Illinois plant. Uh, flowers in, in June, as I mentioned before, and, you know, has a, a couple different flower buds on the top of each one of those pads that last just about a day. So that's kind of neat, all those plants that 
you know, have those short, those flowers that turn over really quickly, but uh, there's a good little chunk of time there that it flowers in the spring. Great pollinator plant, um, you know, pollinated by a lot of different little bees and things that um, uh, look at it this time of year. And you can see kind of the range map there on this slide too that shows its distribution. But um, I was able to get some, um, so, uh, some donations from a family member of, you know, just some cactus pads here that I went ahead and um, you can see this is kind of the, them in a box. And if you notice, I have this special, special tool right there, which is duct Fancy. tape coated uh, <laughs> a kitchen utensil that was recycled as a, a cactus handling tool. Um, I wore thick gloves. I used those tongs. Um, but I still got some some of the little bristles in my fit in my in my hands. And I I don't know. I, I don't think I ever really touched them. So I, it, it's you have to be really careful that. Um, you know, there's longer spines on these that you can see sometimes. I guess there's not really great example of the spines here. You can see a few of them right here that are about an inch to maybe three inches long, but there's little tiny bristles at each one of these nodes, and you really almost kind of can't see those, and that's what's going to get in your skin and be a little prickly. Um, but it's really similar to a lot of other suc succulents. You would start this way where you kind of take the sample, you let it kind of callus over right here. So for, for a couple of weeks, we let these sit. And I did break these apart a little bit more and used just about a single, I think I kept these two together, but you know, used about just one uh, one paddle for each, you know, each or each planting. Um, and so um, you're not going to plant them that deep in the soil, really similar to just a succulent house plant you would transplant. Not very deep in the soil, about an inch or so. I found I needed to kind of prop these up a little bit when I did this. Um, I guess the one thing about this I should say is this was springtime when I did this. So this was, you know, probably May-ish or so when I did it. So it's not a great gardening practice this time of year, but something to plan for next year and start to find that person that has one of these. Um, where, you know, when prick prickly pear cactus gets going, it really can develop into this big thick patch and there can be just abundant, you know, an established uh, patch of it, it really could, you can harvest quite a bit from. So that's kind of the lowdown of, of how I harvested it. Um, siding it was a little bit of a challenge at my house because I have this, you know, this kind of patio area and this little corner where this is where I had pictured um, those plants might go and um, really got to thinking about that. And right next to the sidewalk here, I don't think I want to step on those. So I mean, yet another you know thing to kind of have some caution for. So we did we planted them in the backyard, kind of in the on the edge of everything, so they're out of the way. So um, definitely want to kind of find the right location for them. Um, in the spring, here is the new growth. So each one of these will be a new you know cactus pad, kind of growing up off the off the tips. I meant to have a picture of those today, but they've you know essentially just about doubled in size over this growing season. So nice. a lot larger. Um, this is a picture from nature just of the fruits. So these are the actual edible fruits of this plant. Um, kind of berry-like is how people describe them. There's a bunch of seeds inside them. Um, I have not read really about many folks starting these from seed. It's usually from, you know, kind of taking a cutting like that. Um, but a, an almost like a whole bunch of this plant is edible. And actually, if you look at the history of this, um, it was actually an important food source in on this continent for a lot of folks. So there's a lot of different parts that are edible from pickled cactus to jellies you can make and other things. So just kind of a neat, interesting, different plant for all those people into something, something weird and, and spiny if you're interested in it. So. Pretty cool. And Anne asks, are these considered native? And they are, yes. which is pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah. there's kind of the native distribution what that we know of for um, eastern prickly pear. Like I said, there's two other species of prickly pear cactus in the same genus that are native here, but barely. We're kind of on the eastern edge of their range, so they only appear in a couple counties here in the state. They're pretty rare. Nice. And um, let's see, Mary Kay asks, we would love to get these started next spring. Where can we find these? So you kind of mentioned uh, finding somebody that already has some. Is it good? Because I don't know I've ever seen these in a garden center, I'll just say. Yeah, I well, and definitely, let me say, um, it, it probably is a rare enough plant in Illinois and places definitely don't want to take it from a wild population. Yeah. So definitely wouldn't recommend that. So I had a family member that had it growing along a retaining wall that was planted probably 20 years ago. Um, I've seen it um, in some of the online native plant um, places. 
I've seen, you can you can buy these. Um, so that's probably going to be the best place I would suggest going is some of those online sources that kind of specialize in native plants or have um, just a good variety of that. Nice. And uh, Mary Kay is a Piatt County Master Gardener, so she may know a, a local hookup maybe too. <laughs> she, she may. She may. <laughs> I bet you can help her out. <laughs> Okay, let's see. I think we've had a couple other questions come in. Let's see. So Mary Kay also asked, um, we've heard that this area couldn't be moving from zone 5B, and she's here in, in central Illinois too, to zone 6 due to climate warming. Can you comment on this? Have you guys seen any updates from on that yet? Um, I, put, I put together some information based on the last um, like national climate report, which I think was maybe there every four years, maybe it's 2018 was, I think mm -hmm. I'd have to look back at when that, that sounds about was. right. But um, yeah, like they were predicting with that um, big assessment. And so that's, you know, an assessment that's mandated by Congress every four years, four or five years or so is, is about the cycle for that. And um, they showed um, there was a figure in that report that I used in the different slides and presentations I've given that showed um, the changes in climatic zone that are expected in the next like 30 years. So, you know, basically what I took, what I gathered from that is in over the next 30 years, zone six is going to extend up past Chicago a bit. If that helps you kind of think about in your part of the state where, mm -hmm. you know, how much that'll expand. But that's 30 years from now. And really, when we look at like impacts of climate change and what are we what do we need to worry about in the short run? Um, it's really this increase in rainfall is kind of the big, I think, game changer or thing that's thing that's going to be something to deal with. So we've already mm -hmm. seen increases in rainfall. That's that's happening and predicted to happen more so in the future. So. Or lack of rainfall in about. some areas too. It seems like, yeah, yeah it seems like there. It was very inconsistent over the entire state. Um, the mm -hmm. rainfall this year, for you know, for me, it was enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for some of the master gardeners in um, Woodford County, they didn't wouldn't get anything during some of the major rain events that we were getting, and so it was very. Very, it very variable. Yeah, <laughs> the, the extremes seem to be mm -hmm. expanding. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I would recommend too the um, the Illinois State Climatologist has a really great website with a ton of data and stuff on it too. That's always a good place to to look for the most up to date maps and all that kind of stuff too. Okay, let's see. I think we had another one. Um, Diane asks, how late in the year can I plant spring flowering bulbs? No. Well, I always I always <laughs> assume right up to about the point the ground freezes, but you are the flower folks, so I'll let you answer, <laughs> answer that. Yeah. But I've done it pretty late. Uh, yeah, I mean, technically, I, you're right. And, and if, if, as long as the ground's not frozen, you can still get them in the ground. Ideally, we usually say like around that first frost, like mid October ish, end of October ish. So now is still a great time. I have two thousand bulbs in my garage that still need to be planted. So <laughs> hopefully, yeah, too. I, it's not it's too just, late. <laughs> it's been I, I've you know talking about what's going on in our gardens. I have so many things to plant, and it's because mm -hmm. of all this rain we've gotten lately here in Central Illinois and. I, you know, we've been busy with soccer and other things on weeknights and stuff. And so it's like every weekend, it seems like it rains too much to mm -hmm. for the soil saturated. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat. I've got, I don't know how many daffodil bulbs to plant uh, that are just sitting there waiting. Yeah. I've had master gardeners tell me stories of planting daffodil bulbs in the snow. <laughs> yeah. And I'm and like, I'm, and they had no problem coming up. Yeah. There you go. I think daffodils it, are super resilient. <laughs> you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. I think daffodils, tulips, a lot of that stuff, It's it, they're pretty tough. And and I think if your decision is either plant them or leave them in the garage all winter long, I would certainly go towards the planting, if, you, if at all possible, yeah. Definitely. I mean, if you think about what that plant's doing, yeah, that little bulb sitting there, it needs that chilling period before it's initiated to grow, before it starts to do anything. So, 
you, know, you just need the, an, a long enough chilling period, which is, I don't know, what, like six or eight weeks or something. So yeah. I'm not sure. I'm thinking of daffodils, but. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's so, so by planting it earlier, you know, it doesn't get that chilling period. It doesn't start to grow till spring anyway. By planting it later, you still have enough cold exposure to cold, you know, so that's kind of was my thinking. And anytime I've had to plant late, it's like, oh, well, you know, it needs to be cold anyway. All right. Exactly. Awesome. Well, hopefully that helps, Diane. Get it. You can still get out there and plant them for sure. Definitely. Okay. I think we've caught up on questions and we've got a little less than 10 minutes left. So if you have any final questions, definitely um, let us know. We're happy to, uh, to help. So, um, oh, let's talk about uh, these books. I forgot we were going to show these and then we can see if you have any more um, spooky plants, Kelly. Uh, so I know we've we've talked about these before on our other spooky shows. There's a book called Wicked Bugs and Wicked Plants, both by um, Amy Stewart. And these are just really fun books if you're a plant geek or an insect geek like us. Um uh, it's just really cool. She goes in depth into, in this one in particular, various plants that have wicked features, meaning they're poisonous, or they have thorns, or lots of other cool botanical adaptations um, that you can kind of uh, nerd out on. So Wicked Plants is my favorite. Kelly, of course, I'm sure loves the Wicked Bugs, which is also very very interesting, but we always like to touch on those during this time of year because they're just kind of a cool, cool tie into the show. Sure. Ke Kelly, did we cover all of your the plants you had in your office? I mean, I could pull out some more, but we covered everything I was planning on talking okay. about. That I could always, you know, talk about spiders if you want me to talk about spiders. If you want to, or we can talk about kind of just fall stuff we're doing in our gardens too, whatever yeah, you want to well, we kind of you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, um, you know, fall garden cleanup is, um, it, it, it kind of has changed in the last 10 decade. Uh, we're no longer, you know, cleaning up the landscape perfectly. We're actually leaving debris in the landscape, cut up leaves, you know, the stems of your um, flowers were leading, leaving those seed heads in the landscape because that's that's places for wildlife to overwinter. So you think about it, you know, you think about a butterfly. Um, butterfly egg, there's, there's examples of butterflies that overwinter as eggs or caterpillars or pupa or even adults in our landscape. And, um, you know, most of those things, you know, blend in very well. And so when you're cleaning up the landscape and putting those leaves on the side of the road, you're throwing your future butterfly population away. Um, other things that are going to be overwintering are going to be spiders are going to be overwintering in the um, debris. And they're amazing for pest control and keeping some of those bad pests out of the way. Um, spiders can really take down a lot of things, and um, it's really good good to see spiders in your garden because it means you have a healthy ecosystem. And just varied other beneficial insects. We know that um, bees are overwintering in the ground or in the pits of stems. We know that um, you know ladybugs might be overwintering as adults or um, wasps as adults. So. We need to leave the landscape kind of as nature intended it to be so these things can overwinter. And so, yeah. And I think a lot of folks like to hear that message. It's like, hey, mm -hmm. you don't have to rake all those leaves. You don't have to clean up all that stuff. It's, I mean, it's a kind of an easy thing to, mm -hmm. to do, at least for me. It's been easy to just not do extra work in the fall. Right. Who wants extra work when you don't have to? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I limit my leaf raking to areas where there's turf grass mm -hmm. that we walk on yeah you don't mm -hmm. you don't want to leave leaves that would kill grass because uh if you want grass growing there but gosh and all my landscaping beds and other places any place they kind of accumulate uh that's not turf grass i'm, I'm trying to let them sit till the next mm -hmm. growing season kicks in 
Yeah, same here. I try to at least mow over all of my turf areas a couple of times to at least break those leaves down into a smaller size so that they can kind of break down and they don't smother out all of the all of the grass. <laughs> yeah, my, my strategy with leaves is that a leaf blower and all to like one edge. You know, mm-hmm. like it's a wood kind of a wooded edge, so you can kind of just let it all pile up there. I figure, yeah, hopefully, some of the things will catch a ride with that leaf to the safe spot on the edge of the yard. But, yeah, but that works true. well with like landscaping beds to kind of blow stuff to a central area. Um, it really goes quickly with a leaf blower as opposed mm-hmm. to like, you know. mm-hmm. yeah, Ryan, you're not supposed to talk about leaf blowers <laughs> because of the. The obnoxious noise that they generate? Because they kill beneficial insects. Oh. Well, Just hey, use it all the time. Uh, you know, one of my goals in life is to shrink down the footprint of turf on my property. So I think I'm doing <laughs> enough here. in all the Same areas here. that are coming out of turf that really my long-term plans for all of our landscaping is just little tiny areas that are grass that we walk along, you know, and you know, someday when I have unlimited time and enough plants, I'll have <laughs> all the rest of the turf filled in. But it's that for now, it's slow little chunks. Each year. You guys, I'm making fun of Ryan because uh, <laughs> one of the things that I've been researching lately is different um, uh, things that you can do to help pollinators outside of just planting plants. And one of those things was limit your use of leaf blowers and, um, you know, uh, uh, Another one was turn off your outside lights or limit the outside light use because what you're doing is you're killing beetles and and moths and some of those uh, wasps that we want. So um, just minimize. Don't always think you you know can use the leaf blower because it does mess up the ecosystem a bit. So what's what's the impact? It's um... I mean, noise related, or it's just the removal of the leaves? But. It's just the disturbance of the ground. Oh, uh, okay. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Never thought about it. Yeah. I mean, you think about, you know, I, I mean, you got to do something. I get it. I get it. You can't just let leaves, especially if you have turf, you can't let leaves in you know, lay on the turf, you want to, you know, mulch that or get that mulched on your beds or something, but, um, you know, trying to leave it as, as, as it is supposed to be as much as possible. I know it can be hard. That is hard. That is hard. Okay. Well, we've got one final question and then I think we'll close out the show. Deb asks, do spiders eat stink bugs? Oh, you <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny because I have a picture of a spider taking down a an assassin bug, which is way more menacing than a stink bug. So yeah, that's intense. I I would love to have this like collage of spiders taking down different insects in the insect world because I I look not that a spider is an insect, but guys I know that, but I look. <laughs> Uh, every time I like looking at a battle between a spider and something else, the spider always wins. Mm-hmm. If it's a praying mantis, if it's a butterfly, it's a bee, that spider will take it down. So will it kill those stink bugs? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, they usually say, you know, uh, um, it, you'd you pretty much have to sleep on the floor in your basement to get a spider bite. People think these weird elements on their bodies are spider bites. That's not true. It's very, very unlikely that spiders are biting you while you're sleeping. In fact, they just want to be left alone. And, um, you know, sometimes when you take a spider and you take it outside, you're actually... Um, condemning it to death because it's meant to live inside, um, you know, caves and cliffs and stuff. So I would take the spider to your basement, Candace. Yeah. Take the spider to the garage. I can do that. I can handle that. <laughs> what do you do when you find a spider? Honestly, I kill it most of the time. But <laughs> I know I shouldn't. <laughs> Gosh, between my bl- leaf blower and your spider killing. I know, man. Just, 
I can't be your friend anymore. Oh, don't worry. There's a, a thriving stink bug habitat in here. So there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's no worries there. But spiders, eh, I, don't, I don't need those. <laughs> you know, I know everybody, those stink bugs, they're not going to lay eggs in your house. But no. they're going to invade. They're just unwanted yeah. visitors over the Christmas holiday. Get used mm-hmm. to it. I do shoo those guys outside. Yeah. What do you do with them? I usually collect them and toss them outside or vacuum them up if I'm feeling mean. Yeah, I've just like like put them in soapy water. They're easy to deal with. They're just a nuisance. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, killer questions today, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for our special evening show, for our special spooky um, Halloween show we will do it again next year i'm sure so stay tuned uh we will be back again in uh, about two three weeks for november 18th will be our next show that'll be um we're going to do kind of a local thanksgiving kind of vibe since we're getting close to that date so we'll talk about kind of sourcing things local for thanksgiving might be some flower inspiration you never know so definitely join us and don't forget as well too we've added to the comment box we do have a facebook group an extension um, horticulture Facebook group that if you have questions in between shows or you need help with anything, you can post in that group too. And there's a lot of great gardeners in there who will give you feedback. So thanks everybody for joining us. Have a good rest of the night and we will see you next time. See ya.